Brooke, and you're listening to the Vintage Gardener Podcast, which is where I give you tips and tricks on gardening, particularly if you're like me and you garden in southern New Jersey, which is zone 7A. So today's episode was inspired by a question from Princeton Gardener, who follows me on Instagram. And uh, she had posted a picture and was lamenting the fact that only two, uh, there was only two types of plants uh, blooming in her garden, and she wanted a really lush look and, you know, or abundant look, I think is how she um, described it. I was wondering how you do that, how long it takes, and uh, I responded that, you know, it takes years. And I myself am not quite there yet, though I know from some of the pictures I posted, some people might think otherwise. But of course, guys, camera angle is everything. Um, I, I take, although don't get wrong, I have a lot of filling in. There are some parts of my garden which are a little thinner the other, than others. Uh, but, um, and maybe, you know, maybe I should actually post some of those pictures so you guys can see uh, the spots that I'm talking about. Uh, but today's episode, I'm going to tell you how I go about getting a, um, how I layer my plants to have, you know, a lush look plus some a look where there is constant, uh, constant blooming throughout the entire season. So back when I first started gardening, I of course looked online all over the place, trying to find some planting guidelines on you know how to achieve a you know a look in your garden i am a fan of european and english style gardening uh, which is a little bit different from the u.s i feel sometimes with the u.s we get very caught up in the whole curb appeal thing and so when i look at people who are gardening for curb appeal there is definitely a difference between gardening for curb appeal and just and just like, and just gardening, you know, gardening. And so, um, the European sense style in gardening definitely appeals to me a lot more, uh, to me, it's a lot uh, more visually interesting. So that is the first thing you have to understand about me is that I'm going with the more European style, um, aesthetic, especially considering the fact that my house was built in 1840, it's Victorian. So it's definitely, Um, I, although I guess I could do a modern garden, uh, I, I prefer to do something a little bit more, uh, time period appropriate, which is what I'm going for. So the first thing I look at when I'm thinking about my look is what type of, uh, garden bed is it? Is it the traditional bed where you have a definite front and back, or is it a garden bed that's an island? Um, if you have a garden bed, the, the traditional front and back one, then obviously the tallest plants you're going to have, you're going to put in the, in the back of the bed because you don't want to crowd or shade, um, anything out because yeah, I mean, for obvious reasons, I mean, I'm having that issue right now because in one of the green sections, um, I put what I thought was supposed to be a short plant, um, that was only supposed to get like 24 inches to 30 inches and it ended up getting like five feet tall. So now you can't see anything behind it. Um, so I'll have to relocate that uh, sh- shortly uh, because some of the other plants that are behind it, uh, in my opinion, are not are not doing as well because they're just, it, the tall plants are just like blocking all the light. And that's the other reason that uh, you want to put the tall plants in the block back is, you know, depending upon the sun exposure, you know, those tall p- plants are going to block the light of the short, of the shorter plants behind it uh, that are, yeah, if it, if you do it the, the reverse and put the taller things in front, it's going to shade out the stuff in the back. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, if you have a bed that's an island, then the tallest plants are going to go in the middle of the bed. Um, generally speaking, I mean, I say generally because in my middle beds in the parterre garden, in the, one of the corners, I have a magnolia that's going to get about uh, 10 to 15 feet tall. And so obviously, you know, that's not the middle of the bed, but that's a statement piece. That's, that's a structural piece, which is why it's there. Um, when you look at the, the color wheel garden, I have, um, hollies that hollies marking, 
um, each border and there were pencil hollies, so they're going to get tall. But once again, that's, a, you know, that's a structural element. So even though there was a tall, you know, eight foot, you know, shrub in the front of the bed, it, it, it serves a purpose and it'll, 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 you'll see what I mean once the, the, the hollies, you know, keep getting bigger. Um, so then with the smaller, the small and medium. Now for me, I don't like small plants. Like for me, when I'm getting plants, I tend to go for things that are like 24 inches. <laughs> um, I'm not really, I'm not a fan of like six inch ground covers. That's just does not appeal to me. Um, most of the stuff that I have is at least 24 inches tall. And so even once, you know, for example, I put something, the tall piece in, um, you, although you can do a strict graduation, like for example, if it's like a tall plant and something, then the next row was like, you know, four feet and the next row was three feet. You can do it that way. Um, I do like to intersperse, um, on the, like, I guess you would say the medium section. I do like to in intersperse some medium and sometimes, uh, tall plants. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just that it's how you do it. I do it in clumps. Um, so rather than basically just, you know, do a linear, equally spaced, you know, equally spaced plants, a lot of times I'll plant, uh, I will plant, you know, two medium plants in a grouping. And then the next, you know, the next spot over is maybe something a little bit taller. I just like to group plants. I like to have things in clumps. Um, so you can do it with medium tall and, you know, I guess the row where you would have the, sh the smaller plants, you can do that with a small to medium, you know, medium stuff. Um, so, you know, and if you're growing in clumps, it probably sounds like weird, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it really doesn't look odd that, for example, you have a 30 inch plant next to a, you know, 38 inch plant. It, it kind of, because number one, it's not like you know, if you had a 24 inch plant, it's not like every single plant's going to be 24 inches. Obviously some of them are going to be taller than that. Um, so, um, you notice, yeah, you notice there's a slight change in the height, but it's really not as jarring as you would think. So that's how I do it. Um, I, I can, I do sometimes mix, um, heights, heights, depending on what are, where it is in the bed. Um, the other thing I do in terms of getting a layered look is that, you know, with, um, plants, sometimes plants are tall and columnar, column, columnar, columnar is the word guys, columnar. And then some things are bush types. Um, obviously you don't want everything columnar and you don't want everything bush type. I try and some, and get, get around, there's some plants that are kind of like, you know, in between, but I just tried to make sure I have a variety of overall plant shapes, you know? Um, and then I go, look for different shapes of flowers. Um, I know what's popular now, um, what's in vogue in terms of planting is people tend to do some really, really huge drifts. And so sometimes there's just a lot, you know, in one section, you may only have one or two, you know, flower shapes. And to me, that's just, um, that's just not, <laughs> uh, that's just not how I like to roll. I, I like to have, uh, different shapes of flowers. And like when I'm looking at my beds, if I have too many of one type, I'm like, oh shoot, I need, I need to change that. Like for example, in the purple section right now, um, I'm realizing that I need, there's one, um, flower shape that I'm missing that I really need. So let's go over the shapes of the flowers. Uh, so the first one, and I've got this list divided into nine. So the first one are discs. And that, those are hibiscus, yarrows, dara, things like that. That's what I consider to be a disc. Um, then the next group is daisy-like. And so obviously daisies, be they Shasta daisies, African uh, daisies, which are known as osteopermums, osteopermums, oh goodness, that word, y'all, that word, um, rudbeckias, um, you know, asters, um, some echinacea can be have a daisy, like um, chrysan chrysanthemums definitely have um, varieties that fall into that. Like for example, Sheffield pink is a nice um, daisy-like daisy -like chrysanthemum. Um, and then the next group are sprays. And so sprays basically have a very open, airy, airy aspect. For example, like uh, flax, uh, coreopsis, 
um, Japanese asters. Um, carnations can have more open spray type look um, and some of the dianthus and then like things like Japanese anemones. And um, I like using um, spray type flowers because I think it, you know, especially when you have a lot of very like heavily, like sh I wouldn't say shrubby, but like there's some plants that just have a really dense leaf canopy and it can make, it can make everything just look very blocked. And so when you have Coreopsis, it kind of gives you that airy look. Um, and the thing is, sometimes you can combine, you can combine these because for example, uh, yarrow, um, yarrow has a disc shape. Um, but the plant itself can be kind of spray like, like for example, when I have coronation gold, I actually had to tie, you know, some string around it to keep it, to keep it together. Cause it was just sprawling out, but it does have a very, um, ethereal quality, um, to it. So, um, you know, some of these there's overlap between the group. So, you know, don't feel like, oh my gosh, it's yarrow. It's only this, I, the yarrow kind of works for both. Um, then there's some flowers that have an, an anemone and then anemone shape uh, like for example some dahlias have anemone shape flowering dahlias um, cone flower some of them especially like the um, confection series or the double scoop series of echinacea um, then you have um, mums that have an, um, an anemone shape and then um, you also have peonies that have the shape and then you have uh, plants that are, you know, spikes. Like for example, to me, like a beard's tongue, even though it has like a little bell, the flower, the floret itself is like very like bell shape. Um, it has the effect of a spike. So things like lupine, delphinium, uh, veronica, also, which is also known as speedwall, gladiolus, verbascum, even um, snapdragons. All those to me are spikes. Oh, another one, baptisia. Baptisia has a spike on it. Um, and so... That, like I said, I, I, I try to have some of, um, I try to have a little bit of that. I try to have spiky, I, I try to have spikes in each section of my garden. I think that's the one, I think that's the one of all of these that I try to make sure I have in every section are spiky, are spiky flowers. So I don't know. It's just, it's just, it adds, I don't know if it's just, it adds more, a little bit of structure. It's just, but it's, it's something you definitely need, but you can't overdo it. So like in my purple sections, I would definitely say I have a lot of spikes and I have a little bit of spray like fl flax. So I have a, lot, a little bit too much ethereal. And so I need to, to bulk it up. I need some daisies. Um, I do have some, um, what should I call it? A hookra, which is going to add some bulk, but I, I need some more bulk there because I'm in the purple section. I can see too much mulch the ground and I don't like I don't ever want to see the ground um and then of course there's color foliage so I'll, I'll, I mentioned hookra now hookra you know the leaves add color um it, it has flowers that are like kind of spray format but you know I'm probably going to cut the flowers off because I just want I'm really just looking for the bulk of the, the flowers and then there's coleus which ha, you know coleus adds a lot of color um I've got some red red coleus there's short of varieties that i'm using like as a border in the red section oh my gosh it's it's beautiful it i mean it's just that it's just that the red i just love that shade of red and it just it adds such pop uh to the red section and then um another one that i really like is persian shield um i wasn't sure i thought my yard was a little it got too much sun for that but now that I've been here for a little bit, I think I can pull off in one of the purple sections, some Persian shield. Um, so I'm definitely gonna get some of that. I had it in my last garden and it was absolutely beautiful. Um, and then you have rose shapes um, in the flowers. So for example, peonies, um, obviously roses, uh, ranunculus, uh, lisianthus. It's just, I feel like I don't know. I feel like with roses and anything with a rose shape, it just, it's kind of like a foundational piece to me. That's the way I look at it. But, um, it's great to have in your flower beds. And then, um, the last one is what I refer to as a puff ball. Um, so it's things you would describe as like being a pom pom. So like, for example, you have pom pom dahlias, you've got pom pom, um, pom pom 
chrysanthemums. Uh, the Japanese aster I have, it has little pom-pom type flowers. Gomphrina, it would be a pom-pom. Um, a lot of the hydrangeas kind of have like the, you know, especially the ones that have the round big heads. To me, that's like a big palm. And so, yeah. And then last but not least, there are vines. Um, vines just, to me, vines can add a little bit of ethereal quality, kind of like the sprays, but they can just add that little touch of whimsy and definitely wildness. They kind of, they definitely can be kind of wild. So like right now I've got a, a perennial sweet pea that I'm constantly having to train that thing because it's just going everywhere and it's trying to grab on to other plants. Um, but the, uh, the, the flowers on that sweet pea are just so unusual. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, I just planted some um, cup and saucer vine on the back, um, in the vegetable garden, on, on the fence, on the outside of it. And then I have some snail vine and that's an interesting flower. So, uh, definitely don't overlook, um, vines. I mean, you can use them as something that's a tall column, column nerd type thing. If you get a, a like a TP or trellis and kind of wind it up that way to add some like um, visual height. Um, but like I said, you can also kind of use it, um, in as a spray in the sense that just l let a couple of the tendrils hang off and it just kind of, you know, because it's kind of interwoven behind e everything. It just, it, it just has a really, um, unique look to it. Um, so when it comes to like, uh, you know, planting my actual flowers, you know, with the perennials, it, let's talk about, it's really about plant spacing. So with perennials, I tend to give those the space that they need because I know they're going to get bigger. Sometimes I do push it because yeah, if they get too big, I can always pull them out and divide them. And yeah, I may have to do that more quickly than if I give them enough space. But you know, for me, that doesn't, that doesn't bother me. Um, but one thing, you know, I do with perennials is that, um, I may, I do probably space different types of perennials too, cl too close together. And so what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? So I'll give you an example. Like, so for example, peonies, peonies are like a one, a one, a one time wonder. They bloom, they die. Eventually their, their flowers are going to look kind of nasty and that sort of thing. And so I may put space my peonies like, you know, two or three feet apart, but I may pu put, you know, a foot away from that peony, I may put, you know, an echinacea or maybe I'll grow. Um, actually, I, I think right now in one of the promenade beds, I actually have um, a little lime hydrangea and why do why even, and even though it's close to the peonies, I'm leaving it. And why am I doing that? Because with the peonies, you know, they're going to grow and bloom first. And then that hydrangea is going to leaf out. And the thing is that hydrangea is going to get a little bit bigger, but it's also going to last longer. And so what I'm hoping to do is that, you know, the, the plants will kind of intermingle. And I'm hoping that with the hydrangea, it's going to get to the point that, um, the hydrangea is going to disguise the ugly peony leaves because peony leaves deteriorate over time. But I don't want to, um, I don't necessarily want to cut them down because they need, they need as much, they need as much time to gather light and energy as possible. Um, so that's what I, that's what I tend to do. Um, I, what was the one plant? Oh, actually, even like, for example, daffodils, like I planted a daffodil. I had, um, I think it was a chrysanthemum and I planted a daffodil next to it. Well, the daffodil came up, the leaves are deteriorating and yellowing, but you kind of don't notice it because the chrysanthemum, um, kind of spread around the dahlia, excuse me, the daffodil. And now with that chrysanthemum, it's kind of camouflaging or well, covering over the doubt the daffodil so you don't even notice that the daffodil is uh, deteriorating because you really can't see it because of the chrysanthemum um, another plant that does that um, I think I did that with some yarrow and so so yeah so that's that's kind of my philosophy on planting I love doing that particularly with annuals because with annuals especially like things like zinnias and, you know, cosmos or some other things that get kind of big. 
Um, it's great for disguising some of the perennials that are starting to peter out and look kind of um, um, ugly. So sometimes with perennials, I'll put them in and then I'll plant like a bunch of like zinnias or whatever else around that perennial. And sometimes I will actually, and actually I did this uh, this year, I actually will kind of move the perennial leaves to the side and plant the plant. And what's nice is that like, for example, the, one of the verbascums I have has these huge leaves and I planted a chrysanthemum. I moved some of the leaves out of the way and planted a chrysanthemum. And what was really nice is that because those verbascum leaves kind of protected the roots and kept those roots, you know, cool. So I didn't have to water it as often, but the, the chrysanthemum is such a, is, is a, you know, is a hardy plant. So it's just kind of growing up between, you know, the verbascum leaves. And so, you know, once that thing comes out, you're going to have the verbascum, you know, plant. And then it's just kind of like, where does one stop and where does one um, begin. And that's kind of what happens in nature is that, you know, in nature, plants kind of spread, they seed, and they kind of do all start kind of intermingling and growing together. And so I am a fan of that look. Um, so that's just me. Um, the other thing I try to do is I try to have staggered blooms. I have mentioned before that I don't like a static garden. I'm not interested in to me, a static garden is you have a plant and the only change that there is throughout the season is that it just gets bigger. Um, I like, I like my April garden to look different from my May garden, which is going to look different from June and July and, and that sort of thing. You kind of get it. In order to do that, you have to have, you know, early spring, mid spring, late spring, you know, early summer, summer, summer to fall, fall blooming things. And yes, so it, it does take a lot because basically you need, I would say you, you need a lot of plants. You need, I would say, instead of going for the larger drifts of like one plant that's going to take you from spring to fall, which I know is what's in vogue right now, I tend to go with smaller amounts of a lot of different, you know, a lot of different types of plants. And it, you know, it seems, it seems to work, you know, it seems to work very well. Um... So I like to, especially with spring bulbs, I like to cluster them around perennials. I like to, I just basically squeeze them wherever I can. And yeah, I know that their roots kind of intermingle and grow together, but you know, uh, my soil's rich. I do amend it um, and it doesn't seem to be doing the bulb or the, the plant any harm. So um, I'm going to continue to do it. Um, and so I noticed that, uh, this year I, I have a real gap, especially with like mid and late blooming things. Um, and, and I, I hadn't noticed that before because, you know, for the past, I don't know how many years we haven't been getting a true spring. It's been like spring weather for two weeks and then we all, always seem to skip right into summer this year is the first time we've had a true spring. And so I was realizing just how many gaps that I actually did have for that reason. And so that's something I'm going to work on. I've made a list of late blooming um, spring plants that I'm going to look for and grow and that sort of thing so that I can have uh, more consistent blooms. Um, you know, not just the tul daffodils, tulips, and then boop, I have nothing for a while. Um, I want to, you know, I want to have, make sure there's something in between there. Um, and then the other thing is, um, flowering shrubs, uh, cause this year, um, one thing that has helped with, in terms of flowering is the germander hedge that I planted, uh, this year decided to flower. I see, I thought it flowered late summer. Uh, this year it it's flowering now and it has like a, a, a lavender type blossom. And so it's really interesting. Um, I'm surprised cause it doesn't really clash with anything. It seems to be kind of neutral, but it is, it, it, it does add some color, um, which I definitely need cause I'm still waiting for certain things to <laughs> so like get with it and start, uh, and start blooming. Um, I noticed my dahlias and stuff are starting to come in. So I know I'm going to have some, you know, some blooms soon. And, um, I've been having lilies and bl bloom and that sort of thing. And so, yeah, it's just one of those things that if you have, um, a lot of different varieties, like for example, if like, for example, my pink section, um, 
I have some pink daylilies. When I was at the flower show, I found another pink, um, excuse me, I have Asiatic lily. I found another pink, a different type of pink Asiatic lily. I'm going to put it in because they may have different bloom times. So that way I don't have to, um, you know, that way if I have, you know, one set of lilies bloom, you know, earlier than the other, it'll just increase the amount of blooms, that, you know, that I have. And so that's really what I'm just trying to do is that, you know, um, just, just even, I don't feel like I necessarily, everything has to bloom all at once, especially in the spring. You know, I know come summer, there's just going to be a lot more bloom just because that's how, that's just in general how it always works. But at least with the spring, I'll be having a lot more. I have a lot, we'll have a lot more than what I have right now. Um, so anyway, guys, that is how I, that's the, my process behind uh, how I set up my beds, how I try to layer it to make sure that I have, um, you know, consistent blooms. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I do like plants that will bloom, you know, basically straight from, you know, if I can get fine stuff that blooms straight from spring to frost, then I would totally do it. But, um, a lot of times you'll find the summer things that'll bloom from summer to frost. But yeah, um, my, for me is spring planting things, spring blooming things are the things that I definitely need to work on and kind of in, increase so that I can have, um, as just as beautiful a show in spring as I do in summer. And of course in fall. And of course this year with fall, you know, I'm planting, you know, I've got chrysanthemum, so I should have a beautiful um, fall display. So that's how I'm going to achieve it. Um, so guys, it takes a lot of research. It does take a lot of looking around. Um, you're, you're probably gonna have to order things online. And um, it's it makes you a, a plant collector, you know? Um, if you're, I mean, it's not, I know for some people who may be listening to this, maybe you don't have, the amount of garden centers around you that I do because I have a lot of independent garden centers. You know, even with places like the big box stores like Lowe's, Lowe's Walmart, and Home Depot, um, I know a lot of people tend to start thinking about planting like, you know, maybe end of April, May. Well, you know, think about it before then. Like, because although sometimes they do plant, bring plant out too early, Sometimes the, the, with the early stuff, it is truly early. Like for example, the heather that Lowe's brings out, that's like the first plant they bring out. Well, that's because that's the first, that's going to be one of the earliest blooms. So when they are bringing stuff out, just pay attention to it and, and start, you know, and, and get it then, because if they're bringing it out and especially the ones that they're leaving outside without any protection, that means you can go ahead and plant it now. Um, and so that's the way you kind of have to, you know, to view it, to, um, to make sure you're having, you know, having lots of layers and lots of different bloom sequence. Um, just so you guys know what's on my list, um, uh, when it comes to, uh, I guess more mid to late blooming perennials, um, I'm going to be adding more penstemon, um, salvia, oriental poppy. I brew some from seed this year. Um, and I have those, um, some more allium, uh, columbine. I have some, they should be getting bigger, but I'm going to get add others. Um, hardy geranium, uh, baptisia, and I'm going to be doing more irises. I have bearded iris, but I'm going to be adding Siberian and Japanese iris. And I think that will help the situation greatly. And of course I'll be adding a lot more peonies and roses, you know, because that's how I roll. Um, so guys, I know I've been talking about doing a, uh, another live call-in show. Um, I did a poll on, um, Instagram. And so the live call-in show, I know it's kind of last minute, uh, but I'm going to do it on Sunday, Sunday at 7.30, because that seemed, that was the time, that was the, uh, day and time this, everybody seemed to, um, like. And so it's just going to be general call-in show, call in with any questions. Um, uh, I know it's last minute, you know, but you know, um, I actually did a live a couple weeks ago, you know, with the, when, actually last week when the flower show came out and I still, I got a decent amount of participation. So, um, hopefully it'll be the same. If it's a short show, it's a short show. And, you know, I'll try to, maybe I'll take a poll that day and see how often I should be doing live call-in shows. Cause maybe people would like 
them to have them more often. So anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening. Uh, you guys will remember that the podcast is available on Podbean as well as Apple iTunes. And of course there will be a, uh, MP3 visual, um, visual sort of podcast that's on YouTube. So thank you guys so much for listening and I will see you at seven at, excuse me, at seven 30 on Sunday.